Okay, so lease purchase lessons. Um, when you go on a lease purchase, your goal, your ideas, your objectives is to own your own business. That means you want to own your own truck. Well, uh, I'm going to give you some lessons. Personal experiences, experiences from my friends and co-workers. Okay, first lesson is companies, recruiters, misconceptions, half-truths, uh, things that are not said, questions that are not fully answered. Okay, that is what you're going to get. And I don't care how good the company is. They got some of that too. Now the company may be better than other companies, but no company is without its quirks or its faults. So let's get into it, okay? Now I'm gonna give you some some companies. <clears throat> and you may or may not agree. There are people gonna watch this video, may or may not agree, but let me clarify one thing, okay? I'm gonna be as objective as possible. I'm not coming off of anger, spitefulness, or any type of uh, vindictive vendetta, vendetta, excuse me. So, when you watch this video, I want you to learn uh, from my personal experiences, experiences of my friends and, and, and coworkers, the do's and don'ts, what questions to ask, and things of that nature, what not to fall for. Now, can I cover everything? Of course not, because I haven't went through everything any other people I've known. But what I am going to tell you is going to be vital to your success in weeding out companies who are going to BS you. Because they need drivers. They need drivers. They're going to get you there pretty much any way they can, okay? So they're going to sell you all types of rainbows and unicorns and, you know, how you're going to make thousands of dollars and this and that and that their trucks are awesome, they run great, and, you know, and, but, uh, none of that is true, because the recruiter's job, first of all, is to get you there, okay, and when they get you there, that's when things start breaking down, all right, you need to be conscious of what is going on. You know, you need to be conscious of what your goals are and you need to keep that moving forward. So, with all due respect to some of these companies, all right, they just plain lie. You know, that's when you go through the through these and you go through the experiences, so that you're going to find out that some of these companies just lie. You know, they don't, you might ask good questions, and the fact of the matter is, uh, they're not answering your questions. You know, you might get simple answers like, what type of equipment do you run? Okay, we run Freightliner Cascadia's 2016s and 2018s, whatever. Right, they're gonna, they might tell you that. Okay, it's cool. Condition of the truck? Recruiters don't know. You know, they're in this whole separate office. They're not back there in their garage. They don't know. Right? Uh... What type of, I mean, is the truck going to be clean, right? They don't know. They don't know these questions, okay? But let me tell you, let me tell you a vital question, all right, that you need answered. Can I get a breakdown of the deductions that I'm going to incur, right, from leasing a truck from you people? That is what you want to know. You want a breakdown of the deductions and the fees, right? Not only the uh, the, the, the le excuse me the lease purchase fee of the truck, but your escrows, bonds. Some of the companies have different have different deductions. And they pay by the mile. And they're outrageous fees. Some are less. Some are more, right? You might run into a company who might you might be leasing a truck for four hundred dollars. But the gimmick is, oh, you got this deposit, this deposit, this deposit. Let me tell you what those deposits are, okay? 
a deposit means whatever you're paying on has a set amount. Say it's $2,500, right? You have to pay up that deposit to $2,500. And they might be charging you 10 cents a mile. So if you run those 3,000 miles in that week, you're going to snatch $300 out of your settlement on top of those deductions, right? Now, first experience, lease purchase, U.S. Express, right? Now, U.S. Express is a very large company. It's a mega trucking company. They have over 7,000 drivers. A quarter of their fleet are lease purchase, okay? Well, here's the thing. Very, very few drivers purchase their trucks. So, a large portion of U.S. Express's fleet is delivered by individuals who have the thought and the hopes of owning that truck, but they most likely never will. So, what's going on is you're paying for a truck to deliver their loads which decreases their overhead. They know this. They know this. They don't have the over the you know the overhead of the maintenance or uh, the, the lease fees anymore. You do. That comes out of your settlements. You're paying the fuel, not them. Yes, you're getting a discount because in the way you're paying for fuel. You're paying that nine to a hundred to a thousand dollars a week in fuel, not them. You have lessened their overhead, right? And most likely you'll never own that truck. Okay, and the reason why you'll never own that truck is because the amount of the right hand not never knowing what the left hand is doing. Your driver manager, uh, say they happen to be on lunch break, or maybe they're taking the day off. You end up with a driver manager who has who's dealing with 80 drivers, or say 120 drivers. It could be it could be. A, Dozens and dozens and dozens of drivers that they're dealing with. They're not going to know anything about what you're going through. They're not going to know anything about, you know, that, you know what you're, where you're going, what you're doing, what your load is, what any type of requests you have. Anything that your regular driver manager might know about you, this driver manager is not going to know. There's not going to be any notes. They're not going to be aware. It's hard as hell to get through on the phone, right? Emails hardly ever get answered. So it's very difficult you know, uh, your, now your fuel discounts are pretty damn decent, you know, but let's face the facts, there are times you're going to be sitting two days or so, you're not even under a 34 hour reset, but you're sitting, it doesn't matter if you're in the automotive division, it doesn't matter if you're an OTR, it doesn't matter if you're doing Dollar General, if you're doing Family Dollar, you know, things like this. But let me explain something. You know, I've been to a few of these terminals for U.S. Express. I know for a fact that there are so many disgruntled drivers. To say, and, and you might be duped and say, oh, I'm going to do the Dollar General terminal because they put in your head how much money you, you think you're going to make. Okay. So let me tell you something, Dollar General, right? It's a multi-stop uh, load, okay? You're going to pay by the mile and by the stop and whatever. You know, there's some other gimmicks in there. But here's the issue, right? You're going to unload that trailer. You're going to tailgate, right? Which means you're going to shove every box that's in that trailer, every single package, down a roller system, okay? But it's not the worst part to maybe one or two people that is super slow, don't know how to stack, things like that, you're going to be doing the majority of the work because you know you have to be getting on the, back on the road to the next family dollar or dollar general, right? Because you have appointments to make, right? These people are going to make it very difficult for you. And you're going to be humping, okay? You're going to be humping. So... <clears throat> The average driver that starts a Dollar General count only lasts one day. Because once they find out the truth, they are gone. That's a fact. How do I know? I've been in the office. 
that is the truth. I don't have to sit here and lie. I was in the office of the very individual who changes drives over from one account to the other. I know I, I'm not going to put his name out there. Um, those who work for US Express who might have some intimate knowledge know exactly who I'm talking about. He's actually a pretty good guy and he he's kind of like, well, I wonder why guys do this. They bounce from um, pr uh, division to division because they're unhappy with what's going on. They're sitting, they're not, you know, and if you're in Family Dollar, then you, <laughs> you're beholden to the people who work in a Family Dollar or Dollar General. You know, that's that's the issue. Okay, automotive. Automotive pays pretty good. I did automotive, right? I uh, I had one gross uh, check settlement that came out to forty-two hundred dollars. No, that's not true. Thirty-eight hundred. I'm sorry, thirty-eight hundred. And my bring home was twenty-one hundred. Okay, so it's twenty-one hundred because I managed my fuel properly, and the route I was on had a Love's truck stop that was the cheapest in that route right now you're not guaranteed to stay on a particular route because you're going all over the place but it's mainly right there in that little midwest section missouri illinois indiana ohio michigan sometimes in louisville alabama things like that and you're gonna be in that area around there you're never gonna go way out west and stuff like that however here's the kicker about automotive okay automotive listen to me it's seasonal Soon as that stuff um, slows down, you're going to OTR. And it sucks. Because you're going to be sitting. They're going to have you so knee deep in Pennsylvania. Well, it's not going to be knee deep. It's going to be up to your ears. And all the way out there in northern Pennsylvania, right on the New Jersey and the New York border, in the, in the middle of the mountains, making pennies. You're going to see uh, your pay come across for that load as like $400. Plus fuel surcharge. You're not making no money off of that load. You know what you're making? Fuel to put in the truck. That's all you're making. You do not make a profit. Because fuel in Pennsylvania is like 390, 370 something. It's in that area. It's very expensive. You know? And you're not going to make it out of Pennsylvania without fueling because you're so deep in the Pennsylvania. The only way to get out after you go through all the mountains and waste your fuel mileage, you have to splash and to try to get out of there. What I mean by splash, put enough fuel in there to get out to another state and hopefully you can find a cheaper uh, truck stop all right maybe you go to Ohio maybe you go to West Virginia whatever it is <clears throat> but that's gonna be your problem is when automotive season shuts down or sl slows way way down because it's gonna slow down for months not days not weeks months and then you're gonna be stuck with these small small piddly ass loads you're gonna, I mean, you might be hauling cat food. That load's only going to pay you $500 plus fuel surcharge. Well, you're not going to make any money. You're not going to make any money. It's gonna, All that money's going to go in your tanks to try to pay for fuel. The automotive, yeah, you're going to make, if that's kicking, you're going to make good money. Because they're going to keep you running. And it's all by appointment. It's all by appointment. And you're getting paid line haul, 67%, which, which is nothing. 67% sucks. But the payout is, is good because you might make $1,500. You might make $1,000. Well, here's the thing. They're going to show you the gross. But you have to deduct that 67% from that gross plus your fuel surcharge. You're not getting that all gross. So if it comes across your screen, $1,500, huh? no, 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 no. Don't think that. Deduct 67%. So times 0.67 times 1,500, and that's what you're going to take home. And that's what, that's what your gross is going to be off that load. Right, they're gonna give you your fuel surcharge. You add that on top of there, okay? So the best I ever made was like mm, 16 something, I think. You know, that's the bring home the 16 percent plus fuel surcharge. So that ain't bad. You know, when you're only running for a two-day span, you know, so you're running Kansas City to Lima from Ford plant to Ford plant. You know, that was that was pretty good, and I and I did that run back and forth, back and forth, back and forth for two weeks. And it worked out good for me because there's a Loves in Boonesville off 101 in, in Missouri that's like 276. You know, when you come in Missouri in, in Oklahoma in an area where it's the fuel, there's no cheaper fuel in the United States other than that area right there. That's the area. Oklahoma is dirt cheap, probably the cheapest, I would think. You know, 
I don't know, maybe some of you've seen cheaper. But the state of Oklahoma, that whole state right there, is generally like 270, 260, 250. I've seen it all. I just went through there a few days ago. So, <clears throat> again, now, US Express is notorious for deadheading you. Lots and lots of miles. Okay? I understand they want to try to find you a load. But here's the problem there are so many drivers there. 7,000 drivers plus. Okay? That need loads. All these drivers need loads. So the pool is so spread out. They got to find you. You best believe in any given area, there's US Express drivers because the company is so massive. You know, so you got these planners trying to find you loads, right? And the pool is watered down because there's too many of you. There's too many. They might not find you loads for a day and a half. So you're squatted for a day and a half, wasting money. Anytime your wheels do not move, you can't make money. That we're truck drivers. Understand this. We're truck drivers. So I mean, I'm not saying that you're ignorant and you're dumb or anything like this, but you know by now that that's what we do. That's how we make our money, right? Now they got OTR. Okay. Um and I talked to a, an OTR dispatch because I thought about it. My friend was trying to get me to come to OTR because that's where he was at. So I called his driver manager, and he and he looked at my settlements. He's like, "Just dude, I ain't even seen settlements like this in OTR." He said, "You're getting paid way more than these guys." So I'm like, "If if I'm only grossing like around in the in the threes, what are the hell are these guys making? That's pathetic." Right? I'm like, oh, no, I can't do that. You know? So, you know, I'm trying to run 33,000 plus miles a week. You know, I like to be 34, 3,500 miles, you know, average. If I if I can get that more, you know, because their trucks run 70 miles an hour. You know, you can put in 700 miles a day easy, you know, if when you're on open highway. You know, so if you're running 70 east and west and... Your loads are 800 miles apart. <clears throat> you can put that 700 miles in. You know, obviously variables, traffic, weather, accidents, whatever. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, but you can do that. Give me a second. I gotta take a break here. All right. I'm back. So now. Uh, yeah, U.S. Express, you know, they're very, they will, they will eat you. That's what they do, they eat you. They got a very high turnover rate. You know, in orientation, they bring in like 50 guys at a time. And their process is so convoluted. What I mean by that is they outsource their, their drug screening, and that, believe me, that can take up to a week to two weeks to even come back. So you're sitting there, not going to make no money. So this is what they do. Your lease purchase driver is what they do. Okay, they know you're going to get disgruntled. They know this. All right. So, hey, you're going to go out and do recoveries for us. But let me tell you what recoveries are. Recoveries are drivers who have abandoned their trucks. I don't want to work for U.S. Express no more. You can come get this thing. Right? That's what you're going to be doing. Because you're going to find out there's a lot of them. You are going to recover trucks from, from disgruntled drivers. And quite a few drivers do this. They have hired individuals that's all they do is recover uh trucks for us express because of all the guys who quit right and abandon their trucks <clears throat> so that in the meantime you finally get your you finally uh, are able to go out and say you get that go out and pick out your, pick out your truck well here, here this is what you're gonna run into most likely more than 90 percent of those trucks have not been maintenanced they're dirty as hell inside. They stink. They got 400,000 plus miles. I mean, there's so many miles in these trucks. And, you know, they're ill-equipped. They're ill. They've been ill-treated. So they come in. They haven't been inspected. They haven't been maintenanced. Right? So you as a driver, it's your responsibility to yourself. If you want to make money, if you want to have this business, right, to be picky, you have every right to be picky. 
So you need to open that door and jump in that truck and look at every single thing. Right? You need to look at every tire. You need to look at every brake, suspension, get under it, pop the hood, look at things, look at check the oil. I mean you gotta do all you gotta do all this stuff. They have the maintenance records on file. Ask for them. Tell them you want them to show you the maintenance records. How often the BPMs were done. Okay? How often the DOT inspections were done. When were the last ones done? All right? You need to know these things. Because they're not going to let you test drive the truck. Because mm -mm. you can leave that terminal and break down two days later. All right? That can absolutely happen and it does happen. You know? So you need to go over that truck. I'm going to tell you what they do have. They have an awesome detailing shop there it's a, it's private but they man when they clean your truck it is they steam everything so they do a very good job and they scrub trucks front to back under it over it they they are they're on it they have a very good detailing shop it's not US express detailing shop it's someone owns that that work that, that's there okay but you can get a detail for free and believe me you should do that because <clears throat> they don't play. Them guys, they they steam everything. Even the seats, put plastic back on them. And the truck is like new inside. It's it's all they're awesome, right? So that is a credit to US Express that, that that they actually have that there for guys who are getting their trucks. But the problem is you got there and I mean you only got to pick from Freightliners. They're all Cascadias. Now you can get a tell lease if your credit is good and get a Volvo 860. Right with with the driver lounge in them, those are nice. But let me tell you something: if you do get a tell lease, you will make less money. Fact. I went through this myself. You will make about uh, ten to fifteen cents less a mile. It's I don't know why. I can't answer that question. You know, I don't understand why because you lease a truck from a third party that you make less money. It's really weird. I don't know. Uh, sometimes Tell will have uh, Kenworth in there with the X15 Cummings in it. Uh, I have seen that. But mostly they have the Volvos, which are really nice. Uh, they've been cleaned, and usually there's no there's no issues with them. I could tell I went in every one of them, popped all the doors, looked at them. Some of them smell like smoke because people there are guys who smoke. Stuff like that. So you might get a truck that's broke down. That's quite possible. It happened to me three times. Uh, trucks, they told me I'll go out to look at. Oh, go look at these two Volvos. They weren't Volvos, and they weren't even there. Didn't exist. Okay, let's, let me tell you what they did to me. Automotive driver, all right? They said, okay, we got these trucks out here. Go look at them. They're all broke down, every single one of them. Go to maintenance. Hey, can you get this such and such truck in here? Oh, it's going to be two to three days. Who wants to wait two to three days? I'm trying to make money today. I'm trying to leave today. You know, so here's what they do. They put me in a rental car, sent me all the way to Irving, Texas from Tunnel Hill, Georgia. It's over 800 miles. I did that trip in one day. All right, straight. Tired as hell. Okay. Got to Irving, Texas. There was one truck there I could look at. It was broke down. Go to the maintenance shop. Everyone in maintenance shops all up in arms about something. I don't know what it is. I have no idea. It had nothing to do with me. So apparently something was going on. The terminal manager in there, and he was uh, uh, um, digging in people's asses, you know. And I got they caught an attitude with me because I just wanted them to come out and see what's wrong with the truck. I think the truck needed a jump or something. I just wanted it to start. And they said it'd be more about four or five days. It's like, oh my god. So, uh, the terminal manager who seemed really cool, really cool dude. Said, hey, we got a truck out here. It's a it's a lease purchase truck. It's a 2018 Cascadia. It's being detailed. So I so he said, here's the inspection paperwork. Go on, look at it. If you like it, it's yours. I'm happy. I'm thinking I'm about to get a truck. Hell yeah, I'm about to go out and make money, man. It's a 2018, so uh, I don't mind that. So I ran out there, looked at the truck. Truck was truck was fine. It looked great. So I came back in. I said, I'll take it. I called my uh, my my uh, fleet manager or fleet owner. Uh, Billy, Billy's a fleet owner automotive. 
So I called him. It's like, yeah, Billy, I'll take this truck. Here is what truck it is. Da, 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 da. Well, Monica, out of Tunnel Hill, Georgia, who does all the contracts, runs LP, said, you can't have that truck. That truck's my truck. Am I not an LP driver? Of course. But she said, that's my truck, and I don't want you to have it. She gave that truck away off from under me. I, have, I don't know why. I don't know what her issue was. That caused an argument between her and the fleet owner and also the terminal, terminal manager. She got her way. I couldn't get the truck. As a result of that, all right, I got shipped from Irving, Texas to Springfield, Ohio, a 1,000 miles. I was still in the rental car. I drove that 1,000 miles in one day. Straight, 16 hours, or maybe 15, I don't know, something, but it doesn't matter. All right, <clears throat> I get there. I was told there's two Volvos there, right? They gave me the truck numbers and everything. So, I get there, I get with the, the head uh, mechanic dude, and I said, hey, I need the keys to such and such Volvos. And he's like, hey, we don't have those Volvos. We don't, I don't I have no idea what you're talking about. I said, can you check your system and see if they're on the yard? So he did, he's like, nope, I don't know what you're talking about. So I decided, oh, okay. He said, go out in the yard and look. So I went out the yard and looked at every truck in the yard. There's no Volvo there. there was, no, my, 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 bad, my bad. There was one Volvo there, but it was not a U.S. Express Volvo. So, and it wasn't one of the, one of the ones. And it was locked, and no one had the keys to it. That check. Um, there was a Freightliner there. Yes. It was, and it was broke down. Needed a bunch of work on it. It wouldn't start. That was... The truck I ended up with. I'm going to tell you something about this Springfield terminal. These guys, I give them credit because when I went out there, the truck wouldn't start and stuff like that. They pulled the truck immediately into the garage and started working on it. These guys were great. The mechanic was awesome. He was a great dude. And he got on this truck. They replaced the batteries in it for me. Didn't work. We eventually found out the problem was we got it started and it ran out of gas because it was a bone drive. So they, filled it, they they put some gas in it for me. Or fuel, excuse me, not gas, because gas and diesel are two different things. They put fuel in it for me. Gave it a BPM. Found out. I finally got it started, and the primary tank wouldn't fill. So that was a problem, obviously, right? So they so instead of making me wait a week while they ordered a part, they pillaged a tank off of another truck and ordered the part for that truck. And stuck it on there. And found out the bracket was also broke for their tank. And they fixed that also. <clears throat> and they had, they had to replace the EPU and all that stuff. Okay. So. I finally ended up with that truck. After a whole bunch of work, the truck drove beautifully. Never had a problem with the truck. The truck drove just fine. I drove it all the way from Springfield, Ohio. Home. And then to Tunnel Hill, Georgia. Okay. Drove great. Did my contract, all this other stuff. So, that's how that went, you know. But I'm going to tell you something. You remember about that? You remember that, that rental car? And me going to Irving, Texas, and then Springfield, Ohio? They charged me for all that. Sure did. Over $800. They charged me for that. How did I incur a fee like that? It wasn't my fault. Um, I didn't break down a truck. I'm looking for a truck. And they charged me all them travel expenses. Sure, it did. Oh, um, so that broke the camel's back right there. <clears throat> so, you know, me, I want to own my own truck. Maybe I go to a smaller company, right? So I'm vetting companies. Now, there's some companies I would really like to go to, right? I was looking at Western Flyer. Oh, my God, right? That's like a dream company of mine. I would love to drive Western Flyer because... You go to Western Flyer, you can almost get any truck you want. You can get a W9, you can get a W9, you can get a 389, you can get a 579, you can get a T680, you can get an 860, you can, I mean, you could drive almost anything there. It's awesome, right? Of course, obviously, if you get a W9 or a, a 389, you're going to pay some money because those trucks aren't cheap, right? You're, it's not that you're going to pay the big money for it, you're going to pay on it in the duration, Okay, because those leases are longer than the other ones. But you pay by the mile, right? You pay on the truck 23 cents a mile, which is not bad because they pay you really well. <clears throat> the freight is there for them. It's not a, a mega company. They, they, they might have like around 300 drivers, right? But it's a driver that know 
one working there can say anything bad about because I've talked to uh, several of these drivers. I've caught them and asked some questions, and, and it's like no one can say a bad thing about Western Flyer Express. You know, uh, I thought that was oh wow, that was so excellent. I mean, let me tell you something about Western Flyer Express. If you want to take a vacation, okay, or for some reason you get sick, you can't drive, whatever, they're not going to charge you your full deductions. They charge you 145 bucks. Okay, you might make an average bring home of 15 to 1700 dollars a week, maybe even more. All right, they have several divisions: reefer, flatbed, I-40, and, and lower south southern. We run the I-40 corridor back and forth between east west. East Coast and West Coast, making money. Average length of haul is like a thousand miles. So you're geared to make money there. You know that's what it's for. But them guys can't say a bad thing about their company they're working for. You, I mean, the maintenance plan pay, pays on the truck bumper to bumper. It's a bumper to bumper warranty. Bumper to bumper warranty on the truck, including the tires. No other company does that, including the tires. Okay, tire break, tire burst. Call them, pay for it. Doesn't come out of your pocket. Man, are you kidding me? I blow a tire, I don't have to pay for it. That's awesome, All right? It's just less overhead. The more obviously the business goes, less overhead you 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 spend, the more you make on, on your principal. So, I mean that that's your that's what you're trying to do in your bottom line. You're trying to make maximize uh, your profit, and that's what it's about. All right, so you got that company. I haven't. I never drove for that company. You know, but I can't find a bad thing about him. I don't know. I'm not sure if there is or if there isn't. I don't know. Being objective about this, there might be. Someone, they might have pissed off some driver because some drivers are just prissy like that. They're just easy to get mad. They get impatient, things like that. Or they might have a valid excuse of why Western Flyer screwed them over. I don't know. Maybe they did or didn't. Who I can't judge because I I don't know any drivers that it's happened to. Now. Um, I end up going to a company called Trade Winds Logistics, or another name is Hoosier Trade Winds Logistics, based out of Westfield, Indiana, okay, Indianapolis, Indiana, in other words. They have around 60 drivers. They have a pool of junk for trucks, right? I got there. <laughs> They had a line of trucks that were just broke down, been in accidents, all types of stuff. And this one needs an engine. This one, you know, the driver wrecked it and half the fender's gone. <coughs> it's all messed up. Things like that. Okay, I get there, right? They misled me. First of all, it's a touch freight job. 80% <coughs> of the freight is touch freight, right? Because it's cabinetry, kitchen and bathroom. So, medallion, master brand loads, things like that. You're going to pick them up. You're going to downstack those boxes and push them to the end of the trailer, right? And it's going to be hot as hell in Florida when you do it. Because, I mean, but here's the thing. They they, they mislead you, okay? Because I turn down all touch freight jobs. There's too many no, uh, no touch freight jobs out there for me to be touching freight. And I'm going to make excellent money. So I turned down all the jobs. Well, they never told me this was a touch freight job. Right? Recruiters. The recruiter's name was Melanie. Right? I met Melanie. Maybe she's, she seems like a nice lady. I don't know if she did it on purpose. You know, I'm, I can't attest to her integrity, but I know she didn't tell me that. And I told her this. I told her this to myself, to her face. I said, I wouldn't even be here had you told me it was touch freight. She's like, well, I, I always write those down and make sure I tell every driver. Well, you didn't tell me because I turned down all touch freight jobs, every single one of them. Right? Payroll lady seems really nice. And I can tell she gets a lot of flack because she's, like, nervous when she's talking to you about your settlements. Well, let me tell you what they don't tell you. All the fees and deductions you're going to incur. And believe me, it's like, it's like it's a mountain of them. Okay? So, let me give you some examples. All right? Okay, here we go. My last settlement. I grossed $5,600. You're like, oh my God, that, that's awesome. Well, yeah, but I only gross that much for a reason. Because the operation director made them put that entire um, gross from that haul on, onto my paycheck because I was already upset. I didn't know at the time, but that's what he did. I had no idea he even did that. 
But let me tell you, I mean, that was cool. That was great, right? But let me tell you the other half of that. They took more than two-thirds of that check from me for, because of deductions. They took more than two-thirds of that check from me because of deductions. So I made significantly less than two grand on that off a $5,600 gross, right? Now, off of that, I should have made like at least 4500 I should have brought back, you know, I would have, I would have been happy bringing home, you know, like, 4200 maybe even maybe in 3500 right but they took over two-thirds of the check so that's you know significantly less than two grand they took from me they took almost four thousand dollars from me off of one check all right first of all they put me in a truck I didn't want Right, they told me they were or because it was a quote unquote loaner truck that I wasn't gonna keep. That they were only gonna charge me a a smaller fee on the truck, not the full fee. Only two payments they did that, and then they charged me the original six hundred and fifty dollars for a trash can international. Right, I was supposed to get a Kenworth T six sixty, which I kind of like. It had the IS six four seventy five or something like that. I don't know. And then they wanted to sell me this truck that had over half a million miles on it for over seven for eighty eight thousand dollars. This truck had five hundred and seventy thousand miles on it and was in the shop for repair. The transmission needed repairs, and they were trying to charge me eighty eight thousand dollars for this truck. That's insulting. Look online. Look in truck books. I don't care where you look. You look up. A typical T660 2013 <coughs> with nothing special about it, right? You might have a fridge, it might not, whatever. Doesn't matter at that point. With the regular size sleeper and all that stuff, right? And you might get one for 30 grand, but most of the time they're gonna be a little less than that, like 25, 24 in that area. So like that. They tried to charge me eighty-eight thousand dollars for this truck. They wanted uh, four hundred and seventy-five dollars a week at a hundred and eighty payments. Do the math, okay? So after now, those weren't the only you know deduct. I mean deductions. I had a check where I only got three hundred dollars. They almost took my entire check. Okay. Um, and man, they were just pulling deductions off of me like crazy. It was, it was, it was insane. You know, finally I had to ask them. I was like, "How do you drivers make money here? How do they stay afloat? How do they make a profit? How do they run a business?" It's, I said, "You guys, you, what well, people that trade with logistics and people, those of us who drive for them, we're paying them to to, to, to deliver the load. That's backwards. It's backwards. How am I paying you to work for you?" Right? That's I understand you're gonna make money off of us. That's what the percentage is for. Cause trade wins they you know they give you seventy five percent line haul, which you think is awesome, which that's that's pretty damn good, right? Well it's more like you're making twenty five percent. And they're getting the seventy five percent because that's almost exactly what it is. It's it's backwards, right? They're the ones making the profit and you're the ones losing. Because one, they don't have fuel discounts. None. Now, let me tell you something funny. I, I had to laugh. I mean, it it was a it was a spiteful, sarcastic laugh, but it was a laugh nonetheless. I was in this payroll lady's office. Her name is Misty, right? She's a nice lady. I was like, dude, don't you guys have fuel discounts? She's like, yeah, we have fuel discounts. I said, well, how much did I how much did I save for the week? For the week, one dollar. It's like you saved a dollar. And she said it to me like it was a significant savings. I saved a dollar. I saved more off collecting points from fueling than than I did for fueling itself. Because if you're with any notable company, they get like a 20 cent discount, 17 to 15 cent discount off fuel. So if you fuel 100 gallons, you save 20 bucks. 
once a day to every other day. So at the end of the week, when you, when you know when you do your settlement, you've got like $145 in savings, you know, or 120 bucks in savings for fueling, right? I mean, what the hell? You you look? Can you? How can you look into a a, a owner op's face and say, yeah, we have fuel discounts. You saved a dollar for the week. That's almost insulting. You know, and then let me give you this piece of information, right? All this is true. I'm telling you, everything is absolutely true, right? You know, I like their dispatchers. Their operations director, he's pretty damn cool. His name is David. He's cool. He works with you, things like that. And, you know, the dispatchers are cool. They, they, do their, they, do, they try to do their best. Carl, their maintenance director dude, he's pretty damn cool. They try to do their thing. Let me tell you who I didn't like. His name was Adam. Her as accountant. You can't get a hold of Adam. He's not going to answer his phone. He doesn't answer messages. I had to go to his damn office to get a word out of him. Because you have to deal with him because of deductions and everything else that are outrageous. This is the, that's the guy you got to deal with. And he don't answer phone calls. He don't answer messages. Things like that. Oh, he's on a vacation now. He's always on vacation from his, from the drivers because he never answers his damn phone. So, okay, I get a load. And I, I asked for this load because I went out to L.A. to pick up my mother, right? I did the whole passenger authorization, did all that. That was cool. and everything. They made it very easy for me to do. And that was great. So, the load was fifty for $5,100 and some change, right? Is head. Total of 10 stops. 10. Right? Okay. I know Cali's bad. Right? Every driver knows Cali's bad. Okay? But I didn't know the extent of how bad it was going to be because of this company. Right? Not doing their due diligence. So I go to Culver, Indiana to Medallion and pick up a load. Well, <clears throat> I was told this load was ready. It was not ready. I waited for hours. Mind you, my clock had started. Okay, my clock had started. I deadheaded over 100 miles to get there because I was led to believe by several messages, load is ready, load is ready, load is ready. So I dropped my empty there in their empty lot and positioned myself right in front of the trailer, not yet attached. <coughs> Walk into the office and ask them, hey, I'm here to pick up loads such and such. They was like, oh, that load ain't ready. It won't be due to, to such and such time. Hours and hours from, from then. I'm like, well, dispatch said it was already ready. He was like, well, you should probably call them and explain to them this load is, we told them this load wasn't going to be ready to at such time. Well, that makes me upset because now I started my clock. And all you drivers know, when you start your clock, you can't stop your clock. You only have so much time. You have 14 hours in that day. Okay? So, what can you do? He said, I'll come out and I'll let you know when we got the, the trailer loaded. Now, the trailer is being hand loaded. It's not pallets. The vast majority of all those loads with train wheel logistics are not pallets. It's all machine loaded individual boxes or hand loaded individual boxes, okay? That loaded ridiculously heavy stuff on top of light stuff. You got small boxes you can't even see falling on your face. And it's it's unsafe in these trailers. Right? And they're heavy. They're small, compact, very heavy boxes like granite and stuff like that from countertops falling on top of your head. You can't see them, they slide off the boxes and hit you. <clears throat> and they laugh I'm like, oh, you gotta be safe. Maybe you should get a hard hat. <clears throat> is that funny? I mean, what if a granite top fell on your face? You know? So, I sat there for hours, ruining my clock. Didn't have very much more time on my 70. Ran out of time over there by, you know, just outside of uh, Chicago. I had to do a 34. Right? So, I drove all the way out to L.A., Okay, picked up my mother, my, my great mother. Now mom is about to ride with me for the rest of the trip. All right, 
right, I had to go to Palo Alto in Oakland. Well, here's the thing. They didn't tell me the place in Palo Alto was a residential area, restricted for trucks. Right? Now, you know, when you put your GPS locations in and things like that, and I have a pretty good GPS. I have a Ram McNally. You know, they're, they're pretty damn good. You know, it doesn't tell you that your destination is a truck restricted area until you get there. So when I'm driving through Palo Alto, and it's it's very tight down through there, you know. Um, you have to be mindful of your space at all times because it's so damn tight. Uh, so I'm going down these tiny streets, you know, following my GPS. That's my beautiful lady. I'm going to call her back in a second. And, uh, so I get there. I have to, I'm dry. I had to drive around restricted roads, branches slapping against my truck in my trailer and all sort of stuff. And finally the consignee or the receiver finally calls me, Hey, we're on the Sunset Street. And he, he helps me navigate. <coughs> my GPS at that point wasn't helping me. And I get there, um, and it took a considerable amount of skill to maneuver. Uh, so I finally show up. He's like, "Hey, you did a really great job. I was watching you." And this, <laughs> yeah, right, okay, ma. But I'm on. I'm in a. I'm in a very tight residential area that's restricted. I'm not supposed to be here. How is one of my stops in a restricted zone? This is where this company put me. They don't do their due diligence. Okay, there's nowhere to park in in uh, Oakland. Ain't nowhere to park in Oakland. I had to go across the bay into San Francisco and pay for parking, twenty dollars for the night, and there's no facilities. All right, so I go up the coast, all the way up to Washington, past Seattle, almost to the Canadian border. All right, finally I get all my loads off, all my stops. Stop, last stop, uh, I believe it was Mount Vernon. Okay, so I get there. Oh, let me tell you another thing. All right, you have to call ahead of time because some of these places are so tricky to get into. I had to back up against traffic on a one way street, I had to go back up the wrong way against traffic on a one way street in San Leandro. Okay, to get into uh, to get into one of my stops, you know. And a lot of these addresses are not correct. Their addresses are, most of the time, they're not correct. You know, so you have to call ahead of time and ask, is this address correct? And how do I get in there? Because you're not going to get in there if you don't call ahead of time. So much stuff is incorrect and inconsistent. Right? The only constant thing is the inconsistencies that you're going to fall into with this company. So, anyways... All my stops, I'm finally empty. Um, I mean, mom's having a good time because we went up the coast on I-5, and you can see the ocean and things like that, so that's great. <clears throat> so they find me a load, load pay squat, because coming out of the northwest, but it's going over 2,000 miles, right? I'm going to Arkansas. So I go to Arkansas. Drive all like you know you gotta drive through the Cascades, the Blue Mountains, the Rocky Mountains. You're you're driving through all that stuff. You're going up mountains, slow as hell because I'm heavy. <clears throat> I got 44,000 pounds in the trailer. <coughs> Excuse me. And you can probably figure out how heavy that all that is. You know, I'm like probably like I don't know 76, 77, almost 78,000 pounds area. You know, and I'm going up these mountains at like 25, almost 30 miles an hour, slow as hell. My truck is going at 66 miles an hour. I got to be there in three days. Those of you who know trucker miles math knows that you cannot do that when a truck only goes 66 miles an hour. Can't do that. Right? Do the math. I'm supposed to be there by Friday at 9 a.m. Not going to happen. Not going up three mountain ranges. I'm going up 1,200 miles of mountains. So you're not going to make it 2,000 miles in three days. Not even if there wasn't no mountains. 
okay so I make it there I'm probably 12 hours late I think that that's pretty accurate 12 hours late so I get there 12 hours late they take me I, I you know I unload and all this stuff I finally get empty and they say, oh, we're going to have you go pick up this other load. What I didn't know is they already had this load predetermined before I left. Because let me tell you what happened. A driver, five days prior to me dropping that load off in Arkansas, abandoned his truck in a fully loaded trailer. A North Little Rock truck stop. The Love's right there off of I-40. Now, those of you who've been in this business for a little while or a long while know knows that when a driver abandons not just his truck, but a fully loaded trailer, he was having a, a very significant problem with his company. He was not happy in the least, okay? He was very upset about something. They didn't tell me this until I <clears throat> started going over to pick up the, to pick up the load, which I had to unlatch the trailer, the truck from the trailer. So I had to move the truck. I had to drop my empty trailer, move his truck, unhat latch my my truck, and go latch onto that trailer. Right. That's that tells you something. They. I'm not, I wasn't going through the only thing. I wasn't going to go pick that load up because I needed to go home. And I told them this days, days before I even picked up this load. Hey, I need to be home by Friday. Was no one to happen because I couldn't pick up the load until Friday because of all the stuff they did to me in that, in, you know, in those days preceding. And then they wanted me to pick up that load. I don't have... I only had 12 hours left. I had 12 hours. They wanted me to pick that load up, take it to Indianapolis, Indiana, and then said I can go home. Well, yeah, I would never have made it home. Because it's just less than 600 miles from where I was at to where Indianapolis was at. How the hell was I going to make it home? There's no way because Lexington, Kentucky... And a truck is four hours from Indianapolis. There's no way I would have made it home on 12 hours. On 12 hours. I don't, you only drive for 11. And I only have a little over an hour on duty time. You know, to begin with, I will never made it. And I had no recap time. So I still couldn't have made it home. So they, that's that's another thing that it made me kind of angry is that they did that to me. And knowing what I was what I had to do because I had, I had very important things to take care of at home. And I told him this. I had family issues that needed to be handled immediately. And that's what they did. So I was going to refuse the load and deadhead 500 miles home. Like, oh, you can't deadhead. We're not going to allow it. I don't know how you're going to stop me because I'm the driver of this truck. So we compromised. I dropped the truck off in Louisville. Okay which allowed me to just barely make it home. I had like an hour left on my clock when I finally made it home. Now, that was the straw that broke the camel's back and all the BS I went through in this company. It was horrible. So, I stayed home. I took the truck back. I took it back to their, to their office. I did everything I was supposed to do and I, I sent them a resignation email. I was not about to give them a two weeks notice. They were, all they were going to get is a resignation email of my why I was quitting and all the reasons why I quit. You know, I was very try to I try to be very objective about these things. No, no malice, no spitefulness, no none of that. Just give them the facts. Why did I make this decision? And I told them that this decision was eventually going to come because of the way I was being treated. They said, like, "Oh, Randy, we don't want you to quit because you're such a great driver." Blah blah blah. <clears throat> I don't care about that. I don't care about that. I'm a human being. I don't tolerate being mistreated. I have a family to take care of. Okay? And when you take money that I've earned out of my pocket, you take it away from my family. Because that's where my money goes. My money is for my family. 
So that that made me very upset. And uh, that that was it. That was it. So uh, I never I dropped the trailer off, the truck off. And I had Bob Taylor up there. I didn't have a trailer after I dropped that one off in Louisville in Fairdale. It was clean. Uh, everything, all the equipment was still in it. The, the easy passes and all that stuff. Yeah. Uh, so what we're gonna find out is if they honor what they said they're gonna do, give me all my deposits back, which is very simple because they took so much money from me. Okay. So we're gonna find out how that works. So these are the <clears throat> the issues dealing with lease purchase is the inconsistencies of what recruiters tell you and what you're really gonna go through. <coughs> recruiters need their job is based upon them getting you there. Okay, once you get to there, their job is met. Yeah, you still got to deal with them because they're the, they're the ones that facilitated your you coming there. You see, but you're gonna find out that what recruiters tell you and what is actually true are two different things, right? You need to ask questions. Okay, you want a breakdown of the settlements. What are all my deductions? I want every deduction I'm gonna incur. I want to see them. Oh, is it per mile? Is it a flat deduction? I want to see what the per mile is. I want to see all the all the flat deductions. What are they? Do I am I going to owe deposits for equipment, easy pass, uh, the uh, uh, toll passes and things like that? Um, what are those deductions? What are those fees and things like that? What's what are the fuel discounts? Where are your fuel discounts? Where do you fuel? I mean, you got to ask these questions. How much is my, how much is my truck, right? So they're gonna get you there, but you know, you don't know if you were assigned a truck already. You can ask, like, hey, look, who can I talk to about this truck that actually knows what's going on with this truck? Can I talk to somebody who knows, who has some intimate knowledge about this truck? Ask to talk to a maintenance director or somebody like that who can pull this truck up on their computer. And tell you like, oh, and they ask some questions. Hey, what's the maintenance record on this truck? When was the last BPM done? And how often was it done? When was the last inspection done? How often was that done? How old are the tires? How old are the brakes? You know, when was the last driver in this truck and when did he leave it? This, this is the questions you need to ask. This, is, these are the smart things. Take from my experiences. And use them to be successful. Because um, I'm not here to blow up companies. I'm here to give you good information. Dealing with my experiences. So you don't have those experiences. Right? I'm always trying to help friends and family be successful. It doesn't have to be in trucking. You know, because I've learned so much. It's... You know, you have to be smart. You have to want information. You have to want knowledge, you know, in order to move forward in your goals and meet those goals and objectives, especially if you have a family, because everyone in your family that you take care of in your household depends on you. OK, now, if you don't have a family, you don't have those type of commitments. Hey, that's great. And you have an opportunity with, if you don't have those commitments to build yourself up so that when you do have those commitments, you'll already be successful. And what I mean by build yourself up, if you're already in lease purchase and, and you're paying on a truck and you're, you have no commitments, you know, you, you, you have a good, great chance of buying that truck, paying it off. And once you pay that truck off, that's where the, the big money comes in. That's when you're going to be making. You're going to be banking in that money. But never, ever, ever forget to pay your taxes, dude. Or ma'am, don't forget those taxes. Get you a truck driver, tr a trucking accountant. Whether you use Equinox, whether you use ABTS, it doesn't matter. <clears throat> pay your taxes. Take $500 out of every settlement. And put it back for taxes. Because I guarantee if you don't, they will come and take it and you'll be penalized. And you'll pay more taxes than what you initially owed. And pay your taxes quarterly. 
These companies, the accountant companies who, who help truck drivers do their business, run their business under LLCs or S Corps or whatever they, or, you know, however you want to do it if, when, when you go through this, they're going to help you. They're going to tell you, you know, hey, you should put this in back in order to pay these taxes. They're going to see your settlements. They want to see your fuel costs and stuff like that because they want to tell you where you're lacking. They want to tell you where you're failing. Hey, man, this is you. If, if you was able to do this better, you can make so much more money. They're going to tell you how many miles you need to run in order for you to make a significant profit. How much fuel you need to save to lessen your overhead. Right. It's all things like that. So these are all things that that will not only make you a better driver, but make you a better businessman and make you more successful. So when you do have a family, you do have those people in your household who depend on you. Right. You will already be successful. OK, this is the important thing. This is <clears throat> being a business owner. That's what. Us as trucking, we're doing these lease purchase contracts and things like that. That's what we're aiming for. We don't we don't have the money to go out and throw down on a truck. It doesn't matter who you're going through. These guys, they want five, ten grand, fifteen grand down on the truck. You might get one for less than that if you're lucky. But shit, who has all this money just to pop throw down on a truck? You know, if you got that, hey, more power to you, man. That's <laughs> that's great. You know, I will never hate on you for that. I will congratulate you. That's awesome. I'm glad you're able to get your own truck. You know, and my advice is if you are able to get your own truck, uh, it will be more lucrative for you because you'll pay less in a lease company than you will in a, in a, a trucking company. So that is where we're at with that. Uh, this is road life. That's what I call this. That's what I call myself on, on YouTube and this channel. This is road life. Road life. Now you'll see me on Facebook call myself the All Rainy. It's just it's not no serious things. It's a joke I have with my friends, things like that. Okay. Now my, my Facebook is private. Uh, I don't really invite people to that. So don't expect that. Now, if we become friends, you might get on there. I don't know. It's, I'm not one special when it comes to that. So don't think I, I'm, I'm in all into that. It's I do this uh, to show my experiences. That way you and my friends and my family can become uh, successful if they choose this career. You know, And you can use possibly use some of these examples in your own life and other careers that it doesn't, doesn't necessarily involve truck driving. So with that... I hope all you guys have a great day, great night, great morning, whenever you watch this. And uh, I hope you guys all the success in the world and that uh, you achieve your goals.